So, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Strydon. Um, my name is Alan Young. I'm the interim vice dean um, for academic psychiatry, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Strydon. Uh, and then we're going to have a vote of thanks given afterwards by Professor McClone. Um, so, um, Dr. Strydon moved here from UCL. He initially trained in South Africa. He then trained in London and did a PhD at the University College London. There's been a bit of back and uh, fro between these two universities over the years. And uh, the reason I'm interim dean is because the actual vice dean went to UCL. So there's perhaps an irony in that. And of course, we've got many people here from UCL tonight. And of course, you're very, very welcome. So Professor Strydon is... <laughs> even, even John Hardy, yeah. So uh, Andre is Professor in Intellectual Disabilities, Department of Forensic and Neurodevelopmental Science. Uh, he's an honorary research fellow still at UCL, previously having been a senior lecturer and reader. And of course, he's an honorary consultant psychiatrist in Southwark Mental Health Learning Disability Teams. He's a fully qualified and active researcher his research concerns the epidemiology, etiology, and clinical aspects of mental disorders in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, including intellectual disability, syndromes such as Downs, Fragile X, and Autism Spectrum Disorder. And I know that Andre is particularly interested in developing new treatments and using uh, these uh, populations and techniques to try and advance the delivery of new treatments which might have wider impacts. I think um, inaugural lectures are a very important time in both the life of the university and also the life of the individual. So I think universities are institutions that uh, very often go back hundreds of years, and it's very important that we mark uh, appropriately uh, the arrival of new chairs, and that's what the inaugural lecture is about. It's about announcing the arrival of a new senior member of our faculty. And also, I think it's a very nice occasion for family and friends to help uh, celebrate uh, in this type of ceremony uh, the achievements of the individual. So with that, I ask you to join with me and welcome Professor Strydon to give his inaugural lecture. So thank you for that, Alan. I was going to mention that um, I did make the jump from north to south. Uh, I trained in North London, um, but lived in South London for many years while I was training in North London. So it does feel like a homecoming. Um, and, um, and it's a great honor to be here today at the IOPPN. It's also a great honor to be here today with uh, my friends, uh, my colleagues, family, people I've collaborated with over the years. So you'll have to give me a moment just to uh, set up here, um, just to make sure that I have everything ready. Okay, so what I would like to talk about today is, um, is, uh, is Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, and in particular, um, uh, I want to highlight some of the people I've worked with over the years, the ideas uh, that have shaped my work, and the inspirations for my work. So uh, first of all, I would like to emphasize that uh, the work uh, has been part uh, often of larger collaborations. After all, research is very much a collaborative effort these days, and, uh, and much of what we've done has been part of uh, the work uh, for, uh, that, uh, that we're doing as part of the Lundowns Consortium. Um, and so what I would like to start with is to say that my inspiration comes from my clinical work. So I'm in, I, 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 I am interested in Down syndrome because that's a population that we, that we work with, people that we see in our clinics. But my research work takes inspiration from uh, historical evidence of the difference we can make in the lives of disadvantaged people. So I would like to start with this. Uh, it's a historical paper from 1876. So some of the language, the terminology they use in those days are a bit inappropriate. Nowadays, Down syndrome is named after Langdon Down, who was one of the first uh, 
clinicians who recognize the syndromal features um, that, may, that uh, uh, were similar between some of these, uh, 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 were shared amongst these patients. So in this paper, Fraser and Mitchell describe more than 60 individuals with Down syndrome. And we can recognize uh, from that lithograph one uh, such individual. And it's, uh, to me, remarkable for two reasons. The first is um, for, the, uh, for the insight it gives us into the lives of people with Down syndrome nearly 150 years ago. And so I will read a vignette describing the life of one person. She was called Elizabeth Meldrum, who died in uh, one of these asylums at the age of 40. And now all of these details are given in the paper. In those days, there were not any um, privacy um, uh, regulations and data protection issues. Um, but somehow it feels appropriate to name her um, uh, uh, 150 years ago. So I'll, 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 I'll call her Elizabeth. <coughs> so Elizabeth was admitted to the asylum after the death of her mother, um, who must have been her only carer, which is why she ended up in an as asylum which was not just for people who were unwell, but also people who um, didn't know where else to go and didn't have anywhere else to go. Elizabeth couldn't, uh, they wrote, couldn't speak, but she uttered sounds as if she was busily speaking, and when in anger, she did this with emphasis. And she remembered the faces of those who were kind to her and of those who annoyed her and sought notice from the former, but ignored the latter. She was a kind, contented, and happy person. She loved music. She wore any uh, article of dress, bright article of dress, with jealous care and drew everyone's attention to it. So to me, that's quite striking for the people who are working with people with learning disabilities would recognize this kind of uh, description. Um, uh, we would, you know, this is uh, uh, recognizably similar to many of the people we work with. But unfortunately, Elizabeth died um, a mere six weeks after entering the asylum. And sadly, that was the, the fate of many individuals with disabilities in those days, dying young from what are now treatable conditions, such as uh, pneumonia, she developed a chest infection. And perhaps being admitted to uh, these big institutions uh, made things worse because uh, people were exposed to tuberculosis and pathogens. And indeed, these two doctors noted that most Down syndrome individuals died young from what they called tysis, which was uh, tuberculosis. But I think we can take courage from uh, the astonishing improvements in life expectancy for individuals with Down syndrome over the past uh, five decades, driven by the knowledge from the, uh, of the risks associated with their condition, including leukemia, congenital heart disease, about half of patients with Down syndrome get born with congenital heart disease, a hole in the heart. And by offering appropriate treatment, such as heart surgery, um, as well as by uh, general improvements in, in care and living conditions, nowadays many of our patients are expected to live uh, well into their 60s. So the other remarkable thing uh, in the uh, Fraser and Mitchell paper was uh, they wrote that in not a few instances, death was attributed to nothing more definite than a general decay, a sort of precipitated senility. And with improvements in life expectancy, we now know that many individuals with Down syndrome develop dementia as they age. And the graph on the left-hand side is from a study done by Mary McCarran in Ireland. She followed a group of women uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Down syndrome living in residential homes in Ireland for, for several decades. And she was able to estimate that the cumulative risk for dementia in people with Down syndrome was 90% by uh, the age of 65. We pulled cases from memory clinics in England, and we've shown that the median age of dementia diagnosis in people with Down syndrome is around 55, which is two or three decades before we would um, expect to diagnose dementia in the general population. Um, and so not only are they at higher risk, but they also develop the symptoms much earlier. 
Uh, more recently, we have shown, and this is uh, in press, it will come out next week, um, we have shown in our longitudinal study that, uh, that uh, most of the people, the adults with Down syndrome who die, who have died in, in during follow-up, actually had a diagnosis of dementia. In a sense, Alzheimer's disease is now the main cause of death in people with Down syndrome. Now, um, I think that uh, this is something that we, that we need to address, that we need to, it's my conviction that we need to do something about this um, and uh, that we can make the same impact that we did with treating lung infections and heart conditions in people with Down syndrome if we focused on, 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 on addressing the Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. And in doing that, we may also find ways to uh, reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease in the general population. So here I want to, before I go any further, just quickly sidestep and uh, consider some of the main features of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. It's just a reminder for people who are not scientists or, 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 or medics. So Alzheimer's disease is basically two kinds of uh, problems in the brain at the pathological level. So you have plaques in the brain tissue and uh, tangles around the nerve cells um, formed of two different kinds of protein, amyloid in the case of plaques and uh, tau proteins in the case of the tangles, which is associated with brain death and brain shrinkage. And this eventually leads to the typical uh, clinical features of Alzheimer's, and this is when it's called dementia, uh, with loss of memory, increasing forgetfulness, general cognitive decline, and dis disorientation, and you know, loss of uh, self-care, and so on. And we know from uh, neuropathological studies, post-mortem studies, that by David Mann and uh, other colleagues in the US, that most individuals with Down syndrome will develop the pathological signs of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, brains as they age. So what causes this high risk for Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome? Well, I should explain uh, or just emphasize again that Down syndrome is a genetic condition. Um, it's caused by having an extra chromosome 21. So people with Down syndrome have three copies of chromosome 21 instead of the usual two, which means that they have uh, all the genes on chromosome, chromosome 21 triplicated, three copies of uh, the chromosome 21 genes. Um, and some of these genes are dosage sensitive, meaning that it results in a biological effect, usually overproduction of a gene product. One of these happened to be amyloid precursor protein gene on chromosome 21. And so that people with Down syndrome have three copies of that gene instead of the two they produce much more amyloid uh, than other individuals. And we know that this is most likely the cause for Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome because the very rare individuals with Down syndrome who have trisomy 21, three copies of chromosome 21, but who are missing the bit that uh, there where the yellow arrow is, where the APP gene is, do not seem to develop the Alzheimer's disease pathology. On the other hand, we know of another very rare condition called duplication APP, where families have three copies of uh, just the APP region where that yellow arrow is, um, and the rest of chromosome 21 is, is, is not triplicated. And these individuals uh, do not have Down syndrome, so they don't have the features of Down syndrome. They do not have learning difficulties, but they all seem to develop Alzheimer's disease um, at the same uh, more or less the same age as people with Down syndrome. We can also now measure amyloid, excess amyloid in uh, blood or in spinal fluid using new supersensitive methods. Um, and here I collaborated with uh, colleagues uh, here at King's uh, on the other side of the road um, at the, from the wall, Abdul Hai, Nicholas Ashton, but also Hendrik Zetterberg uh, from UCL to measure amyloid levels in the blood of people with uh, Down syndrome. Every little dot there presents the level from one person. The people with Down syndrome is on the left-hand side of each of these curves. There's, I mean, there's two graphs because there's two different types of amyloid protein that we're looking at. 
And you can clearly see that uh, people with Down syndrome, even when they're age matched against sporadic Alzheimer's disease cases and controls, have much higher levels of this protein in their blood. And so what happens when you have too much amyloid? And here I'm drawing on the work of John Hardy, who's here. I can see he's hiding, <laughs> or trying to hide. Um, so John would be able to explain this much better than I can. But um, they, uh, he and his colleagues identified in the 1980s that mutations in the APP gene can cause Alzheimer's disease. And John then proposed that in Down syndrome, and in other individuals with these kind of uh, mutations, there is a pathological cascade following deposition of amyloid protein. Amyloid beta is a smaller sort of segment of amyloid protein, which is produced when the brain tries to rid itself from uh, the, uh, from the uh, larger form of the protein. But unfortunately, these kind of tend to clump together and uh, form the plaques which has many knock-on effects, including release of tau protein, and this eventually leads to brain cell death. So this whole process takes decades, um, and people may have these kind of plaques and problems in their brain for, for many years before they start to show uh, clear signs of uh, dementia. And in people with Down syndrome, the problem lies up here because of overproduction. In people from the general population, the problem is slightly different in the sense that we think that it's to do with clearance. Clearance uh, is affected, becomes less effective when people age. But ultimately, the uh, pathway is the same. So ultimately, the pathology that develops, develops is the same. So it would make a lot of sense if we wanted to treat Alzheimer's and people with Down syndrome to target the overproduction. So we can do that with uh, new kinds of drugs that, have, uh, that are currently being trialed. Or we can use immunization approaches to try and kind of reduce the plaques or remove amyloid from their brain. And indeed, there have been several drug trials in other people with Alzheimer's disease from the general population. But the problem there is that they had to start the trials when people were already diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or early Alzheimer's disease. So they start the treatment around there when it may be too late. Um, because the damage is already done. But in people with Down syndrome and in people with familial Alzheimer's disease, we have an opportunity to go earlier, to start the treatment much, much earlier because we know almost everybody will eventually develop the pathology and the symptoms of dementia. These kind of trials are already happening in uh, other genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, but not in people with Down syndrome which to us is surprising uh, in the sense that Down syndrome is much, much more common than some of these rare genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. There are often only, uh, you know, there are only a few hundred of those kind of people, uh, you know, people with those uh, conditions um, in Europe, but there, we estimate that there must be uh, 500,000 people with Down syndrome. So there's more, you know, there's more of a need in people with Down syndrome. Um, and uh, when we talk to drug companies and Alzheimer's disease researchers about this, they tell us that, um, well, you know, they, they're not sure uh, what's going on in Down syndrome, um, that um, it's a risky population, and so on. And in, in some ways, it's understandable, because drug development is a very complex process. There's a lot of things happening that need to happen along the way. It takes many decades to develop. Uh, a drug before you can get into a clinical trials uh, phase. Um, and, uh, and so they're concerned about things like, you know, is Alzheimer's disease different in Down syndrome? Can we really diagnose dementia? Would we know how to track change over time? A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to sit on the uh, advisory board of an American funder called the Lumine Foundation uh, under Michael Hoppold. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, 18 months or so ago. Um, Michael was, um, was a Texan. He described himself as a no-nonsense Texan. Um, and he, uh, he, he, he loved to enjoy himself. Uh, he had a particular in, uh, you know, liking for, for cocktails. And uh, <laughs> over cocktails, 
um, over several years of going to regular meetings uh, uh, on behalf of the foundation, we often discuss this issue. How are we going to convince other researchers and drug companies to, uh, to uh, be interested in downstream? And he said, um, this was his advice. He said, well, so we have a preclinical drug development uh, program um, pathway. What you need to do is to have a preclinical, clinical development pathway where you work on addressing each of these questions one by one. And so this is what the rest of my, my talk will be focusing on. I will be taking these in turn. Firstly, can we diagnose dementia and measure early changes due to Alzheimer's in people with Down syndrome? And this is really where my journey in Down syndrome started. Um, uh, during my first training job in intellectual disability psychiatry after being encouraged to uh, specialize in intellectual disability by, by Ian Hall, who I did a junior training um, program with. Um, I did a job with uh, Angela Hasiotis in Epping, and she gave me the challenging job to help develop a memory clinic for people with uh, Down syndrome and intellectual disabilities. For people who, don't, who, who know Angela, you will know that she never takes no for an answer, so I don't think I had any choice in the matter. But nevertheless, I was very interested because I was interested in the challenge of how you diagnose dementia or tr track change um, of cognitive function in people who have lifelong disabilities. And so we linked up with uh, Susanna Walker, who was running a memory clinic just down the road for us and did some preliminary work to set up the clinic, which was uh, a successful uh, set up. But because of all the uh, lots of questions that it generated, I then went on to do, to do a PhD with Jill Livingston, Angela, and uh, Michael King to consider some of these issues. And we learned that, um, that it is more difficult to diagnose dementia in people with learning disabilities. Um, but clinician, experienced clinician diagnoses are reliable if you focus on a change from an individual baseline, the individual's own baseline, and exclude other important uh, causes of decline, including hearing difficulties, vision difficulties, and acute illness. Um, but what is much more challenging is uh, cognitive test issues. So it's very difficult to uh, do memory kind of tests or use the tests that Susanna and Jill use in their general adult uh, um, Alzheimer's disease clinics because people often score at the, 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 the baseline level, um, at, uh, which we call a floor effect. So you can't show change, you can't show uh, track change related to Alzheimer's disease. And so subsequently, a lot of our work has been uh, to develop a more reliable test battery, uh, which we can use to measure a range of cognitive abilities because we wanted to see what happens before people develop Alzheimer's disease. We use both individual tests and carer ratings, and Amanda Sinai, who did a PhD with me a few years ago, have shown that if you adapt the scoring levels, or the difficulty levels of some of these tests, then you can overcome some of the uh, floor effects. So we've been using the, the, this kind of approach in, uh, to track change and to uh, uh, measure cognitive abilities in many, many people with uh, Down syndrome. And here I'm showing some complex analysis, which I'm not gonna talk through. It's a, sort of a machine learning approach uh, uh, developed by UCL's Pond Group and Nick Firth and Danny Alexander helped us uh, with this an analysis. Um, but what we can do is to show what happens uh, as people start to develop dementia. So the, the ones who are diagnosed with dementia would be here at the late stages. But we can identify several other stages which is defined by some of our cognitive tests. And just like in the general population with Alzheimer's disease, early stages of decline uh, is defined by memory and attention tests. So we can reassure Alzheimer's disease researchers <laughs> and drug companies that people with Down syndrome present very similarly to, um, to other people with Alzheimer's disease. The later stages are defined by informant ratings of function. Um, so that's when people start to show <laughs> symptoms which carers pick up 
and so therefore we can diagnose dementia. So the next uh, question that we asked often is when should we start treatment to prevent Alzheimer's in people with Down syndrome? And here I'm drawing on the work of uh, our Cambridge colleagues, who I hear Shahid Zayman and Tony Holland, who have done um, uh, some very, very good work using amyloid PET scans, brain scans that can show the buildup of amyloid in the brains of people as they develop dementia. And they've shown that in people with Down syndrome, the uh, amyloid PET start to increase uh, or show increase of amyloid plaques between ages of 50. And by 50, everybody with Down syndrome, at least in their series, um, have significant levels of uh, plaques in their brain. And this seems to link quite well with some of our work in Lundowns, where we tracked memory changes with aging. Um, this is cross-sectional data, just to be clear. But what we do here is we use a, a, a cognitive test, a computer test, which is a very simple test people see on a screen. Uh, and there's a screenshot there, just boxes uh, with figures in the boxes. And we tell people that there's a, a gift, a present hidden in one of the boxes. Uh, they need to remember where the present is. And then, of course, the screen goes blank. And a few minutes later, it comes up again and they need to point where the present was hidden. Of course, you can make the test more and more complex as you go on. The Carla Starton, um, our postdoc until recently, Rosalind Hilsey and Sarah Hamburg, PhD students, have applied this test in literally hundreds of people with Down syndrome. And Carla was able to show that um, people do seem to uh, have significant memory issues as they age. Typically, of course, remember we diagnose dementia here but before people develop dementia, we can already see lots and lots of uh, cognitive change happening, lots of decline in people's memory function. And so it suggests, uh, in keeping with Sheet and Tony's data, that if we were to give a treatment, we would need to start here um, before the age of 40, or around about the age of 40, and then follow people if we, if we did a trial. So the third question that I want to ask to ask, uh, answer is uh, when we asked, is Alzheimer's different in people with Down syndrome? The reason why Alzheimer's disease researchers and drug companies ask us that is because they want to know whether it will, they would need to target the same mechanism. So it's not an unreasonable question to ask. But I think uh, one way to answer that question is, uh, or a different, a more specific way to answer the question is to say, uh, is Down syndrome different from other genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease? Um, because we already know that uh, some of these drugs are being, being trialed in other people with genetic uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so all we need to see is whether people with Down syndrome are different. And we were particularly interested here in this review done by Taki Ziss, who was uh, one of my trainees and is now a, a neurologist. Um, and we still continue to collaborate. In this review, we were particularly interested in the, in, in the clinical differences between people with duplication APP and those with Down syndrome. Um, because as you remember, duplication APP and Down syndrome have exactly the same amyloid mechanism. So they all have three copies of the APP gene. And we would expect that, all, uh, that uh, the clinical picture should be exactly the same in those people. And so we were surprised to find that there is a, there's a interesting difference or important difference in that people with duplication APP seem to present much more commonly with uh, microbleeds in their brains and stroke, which we don't really see that often in people with Down syndrome. This is very surprising because we expected, if anything, that people with Down syndrome would, uh, would be worse off because of their, their, their you know, learning disability and other brain changes. Uh, and then uh, a student, Lewis Bass, helped us to review the literature in more depth. And we estimated that the prevalence of stroke in people with Down syndrome is about 3%. But in duplication APP, it's uh, more like 30%. So it's quite a significant relative protection in Down syndrome, which is, of course, good news. But in order to understand that, to understand why we see that, um, I need to digress a little bit and, uh, and just quickly explain that uh, you can have two types of amyloid, 
uh, sorry, to, uh, amyloid ore can be deposited in two ways, uh, either as plaques or it can go uh, alongside the vessel walls, the blood vessel walls, where it causes the blood vessels to become quite brittle over time, which then could cause them to pop and cause brain bleeds, which could lead to hemorrhagic stroke, so it's a, a particular kind of stroke, um, with worsening of dementia. So what we wanted to do next is we, uh, we said, okay, well, if that's the case, then what we need to do is we need to confirm that amyloid, there's less amyloid along the blood vessels in people with Down syndrome compared to people with duplication APV. And so here I collaborated with uh, David Mann in Manchester and Marie-Claude Potier, who I just had a meeting with earlier. I haven't seen her in the audience yet, but she was, oh, there she is. <laughs> Um, Marie-Claude is uh, based in Paris, in France, and she uh, and duplication APP is much more common in France than in the UK. So they were able to get some brain material, uh, post-mortem brain material from people with duplication APP, and we uh, managed to get some from people with Down syndrome. And what we found was that it looks like plaque load, the number of plaques in the brains of people with Down syndrome is much higher than, or significantly higher than in people with duplication APP. So there's the ones with Down syndrome, there's the ones with duplication APP. But the reverse is true if you look at amyloid along the blood vessels. Then uh, people with duplication APP have uh, more amyloid along the blood vessels compared to people with Down syndrome. And so this kind of uh, uh, suggests that you know, we were, we were, our suspicion was right in a way. And what, is, what, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? I'm not going to go into the technical details, but there's all sorts of mechanisms that are implied in this finding, um, particularly that it may be due to do something with uh, a smaller amyloid subtypes. What is important to me is that this also have implications for uh, selection of treatments. If we were to select treatments, we need to think carefully about this. Uh, on the one hand, it's good news for people with Down syndrome, so they're at less risk of brain bleeds, which can occur uh, if people are, for example, given um, uh, immunization approaches to remove the amyloid. But on the other hand, we do not want to worsen the protection that they have against uh, mini strokes. And so I think we need to do a little bit more work on that. And that's one of the interests of, Downs and of, of Lund Downs. Uh, so my colleagues, Lizzie Fisher, Viktor Tipilovich, and Francis Wiseman use mouse models to try and dissect where the problem may be, what the mechanism of this problem is. And at the same time, John Hardy and, uh, and uh, Dan Nishtek is working on um, genetics and cell mo models, cellular models to understand this. And more recently, we have obtained um, uh, funding from the EU together with Marie-Claude and uh, Hendrik Zetterberg to explore these neuropathological differences in much more detail. And so finally, you're pleased, pleased to know that we're almost there. Um, the, the last concern I want to consider is, are we ready um, to conduct prevention trials in people with Down syndrome? So the first thing that we need to know is how many people should take part in a trial if we were to do a trial, a treatment trial, to try and prevent Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. And so what we would want to do there is to shift this decline to that kind of picture. So you would give a treatment and you would expect that those on the treatment would be uh, over there, would, would sort of have a response that looks like that if the treatment is very successful. And uh, the people on the placebo arm would, uh, would continue to decline like that. So in order to estimate how many people we need to include in a trial, uh, we can use some of our longitudinal data and we estimate that we would need to see a clinical difference, about 400 people in these trials. But the trial would have to run for several years, for about three years to see that kind of difference, which is a very long time. And so we need to see how we can try and speed this up. Um, and what we're interested in doing is to find a, a good biomarker for Alzheimer's disease that is linked with clinical decline so that we can measure in blood tests or with neuroimaging um, uh, uh, the, the, the change in the biomarker uh, and see an effect before we have to, so we don't, don't have to wait for, for, for clinical de decline to, to, to develop, which often takes a very long time. 
And so here we've collaborated with, uh, with Hendrik Zetterberg and his colleagues at UCL, and he's also based in Sweden, and uh, used a new biomarker called neurofilament light, which is a neuronal structural protein, which gets released, I think, as uh, cells die. And uh, we saw a very significant increase uh, in people with Down syndrome as they age, which seems to be even more prominent in people when they have dementia. So it suggests that this has potential as a good biomarker, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, we need to do more work. We need to longitudinally connect the levels of the, drug, of, of the biomarker to the changes that we see at the clinical level. Before, uh, before we would believe we, the, um, the uh, drug companies and the, the regulatory agencies would allow us to use this as biomarker. But we've taken some steps towards that. Uh, our colleague Juan Fortea in Barcelona have recently uh, shown that uh, neurofilament light in blood is very well correlated uh, to neurofilament light and CSF in people with Down syndrome, and that's encouraging, and we're hoping to do a longitudinal study uh, together with uh, several colleagues. There's some other biomarkers that we've worked on over the years. Uh, one might be able to look at these as well as time goes by. So that's not the only thing that we need to do um, to be trial ready. We also have to make sure that in our clinical service and in our research sites, we are trial ready. We can recruit people. We can um, uh, in, uh, encourage them to have the kind of uh, fairly complex procedures that's associated with the trial. And here, uh, I'm reminded of the time that I spent in Cape Town. Uh, some of my friends from those years are here who were medics as well. We worked many nights uh, doing surgical on calls. I think Loshny, Chris, and uh, sorry, Cleve and, uh, and Bruce uh, will remember uh, working through the night and trying to calculate how many hours is what I used to do. I still had to spend in surgery before I could go home. Um, but later on, I switched to cancer medicine. Um, working uh, in radiotherapy, and I trained as a, as a, as a cancer specialist in radiotherapy. And uh, what that taught me is that um, in, in, in cancer services are set up to offer every person coming through the door the opportunity to take part in research, and particularly in clinical trials, which then enables the clinicians to rapidly apply any findings from big trials, and these are often very big trials, international level trials, um, by tweaking their protocols and improving the care of their patients. And I think that's what we need to do uh, in, in people with, uh, uh, in, in this type of situation. So we're working with colleagues uh, across Europe uh, in a consortium that we call the Horizon 21 Consortium with several groups um, in France, Germany, Spain, and the Netherlands, and Tony Coppers is one of our colleagues who has uh, joined us tonight. And we uh, are hoping to set up this kind of system where we can easily recruit and, uh, and uh, enable clinical trials um, in people with Down syndrome. There are similar way, uh, uh, efforts underway in the United States, and last week I was at a meeting with the NIH, um, and they said that they are planning to fund a network such as this across the US, uh, I guess they would have to spend something like 30 or 40 million dollars, and I really, really hope that uh, we would be able to, to have a similar impact with European level funders, and also that uh, the Brexiteers don't mess it up for us in the UK. <laughs> so finally, uh, do we think that we're there yet? Um, I think we have uh, made some progress, and perhaps I should tell you uh, here, uh, maybe an appropriate time to tell you about a little bit more about Landowns. So um, six or seven years ago, I, um, I was giving a talk at a public engagement event at UCL, and Francis Wiseman, who was working with, uh, with Lizzie Fisher at the time, came up to me at the coffee break, and, 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 and uh, we just soon discovered that we uh, had a mutual interest in Alzheimer's disease and in, in Down syndrome. And so Francis called uh, or ran over to the Institute of Neurology uh, and got Lizzie Fisher to call me. Uh, Lizzie Fisher is a, uh, 
well-known mouse model researcher at, um, at uh, uh, the Institute of Neurology. And so Lizzie set up a meeting um, at the Institute uh, a week or so later, to which John Hardy turned up uh, in a T-shirt, I think, shorts and sandals. I mean, just, I think he must have flown over from California or some, some, something for the day. And, um, and John listened to us for a few minutes and he said, we've got to write this grant, we've, built, we've got to build this road. If we build this road, they will come. Meaning, if we get interest going in, in research in Down syndrome, then we would attract other research groups and form other collaborations. I think that uh, we've made some progress in building that road, but to me, to my mind, the road will only be finished if we have a successful trial to treat Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. So finally, just uh, all the acknowledgements. Uh, I, uh, all of this work has been a big effort, various collaborations. I won't mention everybody, um, but I specifically wanted to, to mention my team. Several of them have already been, uh, uh, you've seen their pictures. Uh, I haven't mentioned Tamara al Janabai, who was our study coordinator, um, and uh, then moved to, to take on another job here at King's. And I should also mention the, uh, the, there's an infant research team at Birkbeck uh, working with infants with, with Down syndrome. I didn't mention any of their work, which was initially started by Annette Kamilov Smith, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, has now been taken over by Michael Thomas. And um, I would also like to thank uh, all our participants and clinical collaborators from across England and Wales that helped us to uh, recruit literally hundreds of people with Down syndrome. And I think the clinicians, the work that clinicians have to do as part of their work in, in NHS to enable research is not often acknowledged enough. And so I listed all of the people that helped us recruit over the years um, to say thanks. And lastly, uh, I have to, uh, I would like to thank my parents who is not here uh, my father has Alzheimer's disease, and my mother had to, to stay behind to look after him. Um, thank you.